Good morning, everyone. I'm Dave Richardson. I'm the dean who was put into a tight spot several times this morning. So, <laughs> Thank you, James. Uh, <clears throat> I can't tell you how happy I am to see this day. Uh, and you know why? Because it's like a birthday party that we can all attend and we all get the gifts. And so I hope that everyone enjoys this experience over the next two days. I am so pleased to see everyone here. I want to say welcome to all the students. I think it's terrific that we have the new generation here in the room with us today to see how higher education is constantly struggling. Young people someday sometimes must think that in higher education, we all have it good, you know. It, everything's just great and peachy keen. But no, we have to work and we have to continue working. And I'll talk a little bit more about that in just a moment. So welcome to the students and also community. Boy, community is so important to this program. All you have to do is talk to anyone, anyone who has a historical understanding and the connection between the, the members of this program, the university at large, and the community is incredibly strong. Thank you for the beautiful, beautiful music to start the morning. Uh, <clears throat> so tomorrow, the college is, uh, as James said, it very, very uh, pleased to unveil for the entire university and surrounding community this new space for African American studies in Turlington Hall. Some of you know about Turlington Hall. It's uh, regarded as uh, one of the most confusing buildings on campus. <laughs> and it uh, also has been known as one of the darkest places on campus because the lighting was terrible. Finally, in the last couple of years, renovations have made Turlington a bright an inviting place, okay, maybe not inviting, but certainly bright. And uh, we took the opportunity to ask uh, the university IT folks who were occupying some of that space that was uh, frankly not very, very useful. Uh, and we asked them to move, and thankfully the CIO of the university agreed to do that. So they moved out. The workers and the planners and the designers moved in, and the space you will see tomorrow for African American studies is the result. Many other units have moved into that college. It has become the core of the College of Liberal Arts and Sciences, and we are so proud of how it turned out. Tomorrow, we will mark an historical moment, this birthday, if you will, that we all celebrate here today and tomorrow, uh, with an historical marker that will be right outside of Turlington Hall. In fact, when we chose the space for the new African American Studies program, we very quickly concluded that the best place of all would be overlooking the most populated and student-centric part of the campus, Turlington Plaza. Turlington Plaza is a, is a gathering place African-American studies program, looking out over it, is a gathering place. They were made to be together, and they will be starting now. Also, I'll point out, and this is very important in Florida these days, the weather looks good tomorrow. <laughs> I checked it this morning. The rain's supposed to come in tonight, and then it should be dry by the time of the unveiling. So don't let that hold you back. Come and see the marker. So I want to finish uh, and just talk a little bit about something I've, I've said before with respect to this program. I appeal to the people here in the, in, the, in the university community, and as you heard, they responded. I ask for them to be caretakers, to con consider themselves to be caretakers of a program that has a 50-year history, and the next 50 years are our responsibility as well. But I also want to acknowledge that everybody in the community, everyone here today, is taking care of this program. And as James said so eloquently, there have been so many across this community and campus who want this program to move to even greater heights. And the 
finally, the, the uh, sorry, I get a little emotional about this. <laughs> finally, getting a department status for this program, a long time coming, we're gonna get it to happen. God willing, I'll be the dean for the next few years, and I hope in the middle of that, at the end of that time, I can look back and say that the Department of African American Studies is flourishing. With that, uh, I, have, I will turn the microphone back to James, and before, as he rises and walks up to get the microphone, please join me in thanking him for all he has done to get us to this point. Thank you. Okay, so now we move to uh, the academic panel, and I'll invite uh, Dr. Nan to introduce our moderator. Thank you, Dr. Segbe. Uh, thank you, Dean Richardson. Um, I have the brief uh, responsibility of introducing our moderator for the panel, the first panel uh, here today. Uh, but before I do, I want to take a moment to speak the names of some of the ancestors on whose shoulders we stand in being here today. There are four ancestral pillars for this program. And as being an African people out of African culture, we know how important it is to acknowledge our ancestors. The first one, of course, is Dr. Ronald Foreman, who was the first first director of African American Studies and the one who had the vision that brought us to where we are today. Uh, the second I want to me mention is uh, a great woman whose name has already been spoken, Dr. Mildred Hill Luban. One of the first African American women faculty here, an affiliate uh, faculty member of the uh, program in African American Studies, and we heard uh, how, you know, just brilliant and how great she was as a teacher from Commissioner Johnson. Uh, the third person I want to mention is Virgil Hawkins. <laughs> Were it not for Virgil Hawkins, this university would not have desegregated when it, when it did. He led the legal battle to get the University of Florida to be an integrated institution in the modern era, and we owe much to him for us being where we are today. At the end of his struggle, he gave up the opportunity to be a student at the University of Florida so someone else, George Stark, could enter. But the fourth name I want to mention is that of W. George Allen, who was the first African-American graduate of this institution who recently became an ancestor when he transitioned in November. So let's remember his name as well. <laughs> Gives me great pleasure to introduce my friend and colleague, Dr. Jacob Umofe Gordon, who is an emeritus professor at the University of Kansas. He also served as the distinguished Kwame Nkrumah Endowed Chair at the University of Ghana. Recently, uh, he has also served as a senior Fulbright Scholar. Uh, Dr. Gordon was born in Nigeria. He attended Bethune-Cookman College here in Florida, graduating with a BA with honors in 1962. He also uh, received a master's degree from Howard University, a PhD from Michigan State University, and began his teaching career at Albany State University in Georgia. Then he spent uh, several decades, over three decades, at the University of Kansas, where he established the Department of African and African American Studies and was the first uh, African uh, descendant professor to be awarded the distinction of Professor Emeritus at KU. Uh, professor Gordon uh, is the author of more than 25 books, and here at the University of Florida, he was not only an active member of the planning committee for this symposium, but he was the chair of a committee that was founded by class to determine the future of the program and, in fact, to establish a department uh, of the program 
uh, and uh, did yeoman efforts in that regard. So without further ado, I give to you my colleague, my friend, Dr. Jacob Umofe Gordon. Thank you, brother. Thank you, thank you. That was a very, very kind introduction, and I appreciate it. I want to say good morning to everyone here. And I thank you for your presence in witnessing the celebration of the 50th anniversary of African American Studies Program at the University of Florida. This is undoubtedly an important milestone in the history, culture, and traditions of the University of Florida. As an institution of higher education, the university is essentially a community of students, teachers, and scholars. And sometimes we reluctantly add administrators. It is the repository and generator of knowledge production and dissemination. It is worth noting that among other things, the traditional role of the university, since the first university in Africa in 859 AD, and then the first American university, Harvard, in 1636, that rule has always been threefold. Research, teaching, and public service. The academic, plo uh, uh, academic panel you're about to hear from is designed to focus on one of those, and that is research and related activities to research. It is in this context, then, that the panel explores the extent to which African American Studies program at UF has contributed to knowledge production and dissemination in the past 50 years. We plan to probe three related questions. One, what is the significance of African American Studies program to the academic mission of the University of Florida? Two, what contributions has African American Studies program made to the advancement of knowledge and its application in African American studies? Three, what lessons have we learned? And where do we go from here? Now, at this point, I would like my panelists to please come forward, if you don't mind. Panelists are Dr. Patricia Elliott Nam. I want to make sure I get all the names. Dr. Paul Ortiz. Dr. Mushka Celeste. Mushka. She told me it should be Mushka. Manushka. 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 Manushka Celeste. And Stephanie Beach, please. Stephanie? I'm right here. <laughs> She's working. And uh, Dr. Shaw, are you here? Right here. Come on now. <laughs> That's what they say. Come on now. Here are the rules for the panel discussion. Every presenter will have 15 minutes. We have a timekeeper. OK? After all presentations, there will be a question and answer session. Following that will be a closing remark, some closing remarks by Dr. Shaw.
Now, I'm going to present them. The first presenter is going to be Dr. Patricia Nunn. And her topic is in your program. She will talk about some historical aspects of African American Studies program at UF. In other words, she's going to tell the story. Since 50 years, she'll be the first storyteller. Not yet. <laughs> All right, you, you get to it, don't worry. The second presenter is going to be Dr. Paul Otik. Paul Otik, he is a specialist in oral history and tradition. His topic is going to look at oral tradition, the significance of oral tradition or oral history in African American studies. The third speaker is going to be Manishka Celeste, who's associate professor. By the way, Paul is full professor in history department, and uh, Tricia is senior lecturer in African American studies program. All their titles are listed in the program. Sister Manish, Manishka will speak about some selected contributions or works of faculty members in this program for the past 50 years. That is quite a big task. But I don't know how she's going to do it. Uh, she will present us some key contributions that have been made here at the Uni University of Florida. The last but not the least, my friend Stephanie. She comes from what I call the most important venue for scholarship in any university, and that's the library and the archives. She will bring it all together to give us the state of African American studies collections at the University of Florida, both libraries and the archives. This is very, very important. And so to begin our dialogue, now I call on my good friend, Tricia. Tell us our story. How do we get it? Thank you. Do I need to use this or can I use the, oh, okay, I'm going to use that. Oh, yeah. We have a quick announcement. Also, um, if you could, uh, folks could file in and squish into some of the seats. As you can see, we're running out of room and chairs. So if there's an empty seat next to you, please nudge in. Thanks. Yeah, there's pl plenty of seats on this side if anyone wants to come over there. So, okay. All right, uh, just before I start, I wanna ask if there's anybody in the room who is 80 years or older. Is anybody 80 years or old? What? You're impersonating senior citizens. I see there are two hands. Anybody 81 or older? Okay, we, have, we still have two hands. We have one over here too? Okay, two. Okay, 82 or older? Uh-oh, but, but, but still, 83? Okay, uh, so well, I'm going to respectfully request the permission of Mother um, Vivian Filer and Father <laughs> uh, Harry Shaw for permission to speak and begin. So great. Thank you. Okay, so um, in this um, spirit and remembering um, people like David Walker, Frederick Douglass, Sojourner Truth, W.B. Du Bois, um, Anna Julia Cooper, Carter G. Woodson. John Henry Clark, Mary McLeod Bethune, Ida B. Wells. The list goes on and on and on. We stand on those shoulders. Um, as we talk about African American studies, people who were doing that before there was African American studies. Um, it's a distinct honor um, and a pleasure to be here. Um, again, to the elders and to my colleagues and to, um, especially to the community, to and our, our faculty. Could the other, um, the faculty, as, as, please just stand. Like, if you're a faculty, core faculty, because we've been working hard, please, yes, stand. Yeah, Jumo, Dr. Stevenson, visiting professor. Okay, please. I love these folks. We're few in numbers, but we've been working hard. <laughs> uh, love you all. So today I'm just going to share a little bit about this 50-year journey. Um, and it was very fitting that um, 1,000 voices started, all the Mount Carmel family. Can we, can we give it up for them? Okay. 
They beat us up here on campus. <laughs> Love you all. Love you all. Um, and it's because of uh, that inspiration, again, I give thanks for life, health, and strength. African American studies programs, departments, and centers may be found at institutions all around this country. The character of each department will depend on the mission um, of the leadership, the faculty, and the students. African American studies is a vibrant discipline where scholars are producing cutting edge researchers that exposes, analyzes, challenges um, the many facets and intersections of the black experience. This experience is comprehensive and incorporates the black experience in the US and beyond. The research encompasses science, history, art, medicine, law, business, language, spirituality, politics, and anything and everything that may be explored. Today, the concepts of digital media, internationalism, intersectionality, mass incarceration, and more blend well with this mission. African American studies at the University of Florida is a part of this tradition. And when I think about the founding of our program, the concepts of purpose, struggle, and collaboration come to mind. Purpose, the infusion of that information into the universe of information, granting access to anyone who was interested in this and receiving a quality education why that information is solidified in their spirit and consciousness. Struggle, no progress has been made without struggle and this is something that Dean Shaw has always reminded me of. This has included the hiring, funding, establishing the minor, the major, moving toward establishing a department. Issues related to space, something like space, and budgeting have also been an issue. This struggle is the same at other institutions around the nation. Collaboration is another point. There has always been collaboration. A collaborative spirit in the building of this program has always included students, faculty, staff, administrators, and the community. It was never either or. African American Studies is here today because of the fortitude of Vir Virgil Darnell Hawkins, George Stark, of course, who would be the first black person to enter the University of Florida, Daphne Duval Williams, who would be the first woman to black woman to enter the University of Florida. And I have to tell you, because we're all family in here, it's, it's, it's tricky sharing this information because, because the community is here. A lot of the family members of everybody I'm mentioning are here too, right? Um, including Vianne Ginyard, the um, daughter of Oliver Maxey, um, who was one of those people who stood, yes, amen, with Virgil Hawkins when he applied back in the day. And so um, it's somebody who I had the pleasure of knowing. So they know all these people. So, so George Stark, who was actually the, the cousin of Daphne Duval Williams, um, of course, the Honorable Stephen um, Mickle, um, who would be the first black person to graduate, will be here um, a little later on this afternoon. We have to make sure he gets a good parking lot up front here. So the founding of African American Studies relied on people pay these people paving the way, while they were not here studying in an African American studies pro program, they weren't majors, they couldn't have been because it wasn't here. Um, they were the ones who endured those challenges because when they came and desegregated the school. They all contributed to ensuring that other black students would be able to follow in their footsteps. So for example, George Allen helped to recruit others, including Stephen Mickle, to come to the University of Florida and, and met with the family, um, Andrew Mickle, Catherine Mickle, who took care of them, McKay Banks, who took care of them in the community when he came so that they could survive and not feel um, like outsiders or have a place to go later. So the other students who, again, uh, you know, who came with um, Judge Mickle were Marie Davis, Jesse Dean, Rose Green, Oliver Gordon, um, Joe, John Reddick, and Janaya Williams. 
Jesse Dean, um, who had transferred to the University of Florida as a junior during the 60s, was active also with the youth chapter of the NAACP. He invited um, UF professor of psychiatry, Marshall Jones, Dr. Marshall Jones, and his wife Beverly to attend some of the youth chapter NAACP meetings. Um, those of you who don't know Dr. Marshall Jones, he was a white professor here um, who was an activist who worked to desegregate the University of Florida and suffered dearly um, um, for that. Um, they went for him <laughs> because of his um, efforts. But they worked together with the students for equal rights who then, and then the offshoot of that was what the, um, um, the Gainesville Women for Equal Rights of which um, uh, Vivian, Mother Vivian and others, any, any other Gainesville Women for Equal Rights um, in here, okay? Because they're important to the African American studies because it was because of their work that made it possible for black students to enter and, and, and anybody to enter who had the um, understanding that this is the subject that needed to be studied here. So the growth of black studies in the United States, was a, it was a national movement. During the 1960s, the nation was polarized by struggles for voting rights, equality, desegregation. People were protesting against police violence, protesting against wars, work, uh, working um, um, to achieve justice. There were sit-ins, strikes, boycotts, um, poor people's marches, other protests. Activism in the United States influenced and was influenced by by interna also international liberation movements. In short, people were engaging in activities to improve their condition. Black students then were influenced by both civil rights and black power ideology. David Horn, a graduate student at the time, who was here? Raise your hand, thank you. <laughs> Just think, Dr. David Horn now. <laughs> um, he had said that he and others were aware of student activism around the country. Black students who were newly admitted to the predominantly white institutions found themselves in spaces where they weren't always treated well and in classes that did not infuse their history, their culture, or their experiences. They also were not getting exposed to black studies scholarship. These writers, some of the names that I had mentioned to you earlier, um, beyond some scholars who would just focus on black pathology. So in 1967, Stephen C. O'Connell retired as Chief Justice of the Florida Supreme Court to become the president of the Uni University of Florida. Upon his arrival, black students initiated, among other things, an organization called the Afro-American Student Association. Do you remember that, Dr. Horn? Okay. Okay, to address their concerns. There were no black faculty at the time or black administrators at the time, but their goal was still in in spite of the fact that they were here and these black, first black students had been consciously selected and prepared to desegregate the University of Florida. They were the creme de la creme, the best people in their communities, and they came here, and Dr. Horn um, was one of, among that group. But even though they were here, they were thinking about other people who would follow. It wasn't just about them. They were thinking, who else will come and um, be able to participate and take advantage of this, uh, this this public institution um, that our tax dollars are paying for, right? And so as part of their efforts to create an equitable environment, students tried to gather UF racial statistics. This is just one of the things um, that had happened. Specifically, the names of all black UF students and administrators at UF. They were given a list, for example, of 80 names that included part-time students, um, those who had never attended UF, you know, because they were trying. So what was the university? University was doing was trying to boost the numbers to make it look like there were actually more black students than there were. But these people who were students still did their own research and they looked and they found that there were actually about 40 um, students at, at that time. After doing more research, they began presenting detailed recommendations to President O'Connell for the improvement of the University of Florida, recommendations that he ignored. In the spring of 1968, the UF College of Law hired Spencer Boyd and he would become the first um, University of Florida, black professor at the University of F Florida. Unfortunately, the April 4th assassination of Dr. Martin Luther King um, 
which was inspired uh, uh, inspired a caller to threaten a, a Boyer uh, with the same fate. And so he wound up leaving town and actually Jeff, Steph, Judge Mickle and another student who was in the law school at the time drove him to the train station um, to go back to Washington, D.C. and continue teaching law at Howard University. So Dr. King's assassination may have inspired some reflection on the part of U.S. leadership because as in July of that same year after ignoring student requests, um, President O'Connell held an action conference to address race at the University of Florida. And these participants were charged with developing a non-discrimination plan. The attendees recommended creating an office of the coordinator for minority and disadvantaged students and the appointment of an, uh, a Negro assistant dean of student affairs. Significantly, the very students who had reached out to O'Connell and made specific recommendations were not invited to the conference. Still, their proposals about hiring, curriculum development, financing um, were, were copied. <laughs> um, in fact, in the fall of 1968, uh, when that semester started, um, Dr. Horn, um, David at the time, okay, he was surprised that President O'Connell began implementing some of the very things that he and other students had been requesting, um, including the establishment of an Afro-American studies program and the recruiting of more, what they said, minority um, students. He did not, O'Connell did not communicate with the students who made the request in the first place. So in 1969, there were about 100 black students uh, out of 25,000 students at the University of Florida. That fall, Dr. Uh, Roy Mitchell, was hired as UF's first black administrator in the position of coordinator for disadvantaged students and minority affairs. Also the director of minority affairs. And when you're doing conducting research on this, he's labeled, you know, with anything connected to, you know, black people. <laughs> so he had all there are all these labels. But in 1969, there were um, oh I'm sorry. In October of 1969, black students chose to end their Afro-American student organization and then founded what the Black Student Union. Uh, uh, the BSU was not formally recognized by UF, but the students were a part of a national movement of BSU chapters um, who were focused on um, transforming these institutions. Michael Dasher, who was a BSU president at the time, said, we are more political and militant than the AASU. As a political organization, we are not as culturally nationalistic um, as the AASA. We are rev more revolutionary nationals. Larry Jordan, the secretary, of Minority Affairs on the student government said, we formed the BSU because as full-time black students become political, we could no longer ignore the problems in the community of black people. So against this black drop, black students at UF continued to organize. While black students gained entry to UF, they were concerned about um, not being represented in the curriculum. At um, UF and other black studies programs and departments, black students um, and sympathetic white faculty and staff and local community members collaborated to support the struggles, protests, and demands for a program. So when the Afro-American Studies program was then established in 1969, Dr. Selden Henry, who's a, a black, white faculty member, he was the advisor and head of that, that program as it was getting off the ground. The first African-American Studies instructors were actually graduate students like Dr. David Horn at the time. Time. Emerson Thompson, now Judge Thompson, who'll be here later if he's not here already. Sam Taylor, who would later become U.S. first black student body president in 1972. <laughs> Other instructors were white UF affiliate professors in history, social sciences, African studies, and the political science departments. A search committee was established to find a new director of African American studies. Um, Dr. Harold Steimer talks about that and how they plan to find this person. And that person would be Dr. Ronald C. Foreman, senior, who was hired in 1970. And that was a post that he would hold until he 
retired in 2000. Dr. Foreman, Dr. Carlton Davis, and Dr. Elwin Adams then would, are often considered the first three tenure track black faculty members at the University of Florida, but they would be followed rather quickly by others including Dr. Shaw, Dean Sh Harry Shaw, Dr. Mildred Hill Lubin, Dr. Carlton Davis, who's still with us, um, Dr. Alroy um, Chow, and um, Dr. And, and, and others. So Dr. Foreman, Roy Mitchell, and others were critical advisors who supported students in numerous matters, including the pivotal Black Thursday protest in April of 1971. This tradition of faculty and staff support was seen in other contexts, including the NOLA IBC to protest in 2017, when students worked to keep the Institute of Black Culture and La Casita separate buildings. As we celebrate 50 years and stand at the dawn of the formation of a Department of African American Studies at the University of Florida, it is significant that we have been able to achieve the things that we have in spite of the challenges, in spite of, this, of those struggles. We have varied course offerings that reflect our interdisciplinary foundations. The program has always collaborated with other centers, other departments, and other institutions and community groups on a variety, varied initiatives to promote the teaching of African American history and culture, um, but not just continental, but throughout the globe. We have moved from offering certificates in African American studies to offering a minor in 2006, and then in the spring of 2014, we were awarded the first African American, we awarded the first African American studies degrees. One of those people who earned that degree um, will be here sharing tomorrow at the um, community program. So we are very, yes, yes, um, I want to say Dr. Brianka Taylor, but she, but she's almost, she'll soon be a doctor. <laughs> um, she's studying at UNC. But we are very proud of and honored to work with the current and former students who have watched, we've watched mature, um, like Commissioner, uh, um, Johnson and demonstrate excellence and make contributions on campus in the state and in the nation and throughout the world. I have met, I was as I was thinking about this, I said I've met all of the directors, right? All of them and worked with all of these directors and I must name them. Dr. Ronald C. Foreman, Dr. Daryl Scott, Dr. Marilyn Thomas Houston, Dr. Terry Mills, Dr. Faye Harrison, and one of her partners in crime, Dr. William Conwell is here, who was on the faculty. Raise your hand, give a shout out. Thank you. He's on the faculty here, too. Dr. Stephanie Evans, Dr. Sharon Austin, and our um, wonderful, delightful Dr. James Asegbe. Okay, so. I'm almost done. <laughs> the African American Studies program has faced challenges, but even so, um, we have more majors and minors than African American programs and departments throughout the country. Our team, our, thank you, our team has exhibited excellence and we are pleased to work with students, administration, staff, affiliates, and the community at large to help this program continue to thrive and transition into a department. As we celebrate 50 years, we look forward to the hiring of a new director that will lead this effort, and we are thankful to the, the Dean, Dean Richardson, and others, and the rest of you who will make sure that this becomes a reality. Thank you very much.